next on the gridiron in September. Perfected in the magic of March. For the fans who love the crunch of the pads, prefer a dunk, and expect nothing but the best. It's Bigger Tag. Here's Steve Dace. And thank you. Welcome to another week right here on Bigger Ten. I'm Steve Dace alongside the co-host who is never my partner, the one and only Aaron McIntyre. And we are now, it kind of feels like we're we're all the way in on the season now, Aaron. Non-conference games largely done. Yep. Pretty much everybody's played a game on the road, right? You yep. know, and so now it seems like it's time to kind of settle in here now that we head into October. And, and October is, se- is separation month. We find out who the real contenders are. And then November is, you know, championship month. Or as Lee Corso used to say back in the day, the games you remember are the ones played in November. And it seems like this is kind of that time now. I'll tell you what, though, last Saturday did not feel like the last day of September slash early October. I had to mow the lawn. And of course, I had an evening game. So I'm out there in the middle of the day. And it's, I'm trying it was to warm. mow. I'm, I was trying to mow a little bit shorter um, because it's, you know, I'm just getting ready for the first frost. You're supposed to mow it a little bit shorter. And man alive, that was tough sledding. Fortunately, I have. Have you ever uh, listened to College Football Blitz on Sirius XM? I have. Yes. Yeah, I have. That's Isn't pretty that good. Isn't that a great yeah. program? Kind of where they go around to all the games it's and like everything. It's like the NFL yeah. red zone of, uh, yeah. of college football. So that was uh, the only redeeming uh, uh, quality about the two hours or so I spent outside. But other than that, it was a great another great day of, of football last weekend. And I uh, can't wait for this one. Well, let's get to it. So much to talk about. Let's go right to the Big Five on Bigger Ten, and there was so much talk that Iowa had finally found its quarterback, and not just any quarterback, but one that seemed perfect for the program, a a guy who had helped resurrect the Michigan program and and basically saved Jimmy Harbaugh's job, won a Big Ten, his style of play, his style of, of leadership, a perfect seamless fit with the Iowa program. Of course, I'm talking about Cade McNamara, but You know, he had that quad injury that looked bad early in camp, missed a lot of camp, made it pretty plain. He was going to play hurt all year long. And now he has torn his ACL against Michigan State and is done for the year. And Iowa now is kind of back to square one at the quarterback position all over again. This is the biggest injury in our league so far. That's why it leads off. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if he didn't play another down for Iowa. I was shocked when I saw that his uh, parents had... Um, come out to Iowa's NIL collective and said, yeah, we're planning on being back uh, next year. And you have reminded me that his parents last year uh, and around this time frame yeah. said that they, you know, we're coming back to Michigan for sure. So would not surprise me in the least if this was it for him. And honestly, just taking uh, off my black and gold tinged sunglasses here. Why would you come back? There weren't any major schematic changes in Iowa's offense. You were getting your ass chewed by Brian Ferentz for taking risks against Western Michigan. Okay. You're surrounded by talent that you don't have at Michigan in a system that doesn't really let you show off, I think, what you know, what you saw from him at, at Michigan. So why would you come back? So that's my first thing. And I, I really appreciated the confidence, the swagger uh, a little bit that he brought into Iowa, but Because of the injuries, that's on Iowa's fault. That's not Cade's fault. It's just we never really got to see all of him. I will say, and I know I'm going to get scoffed at here, just by virtue of the fact that Deacon Hill isn't trying to play with a pretty serious leg injury, I do think, all things considered, I do think Iowa's um, going to be a little bit more advantageous in advantageous situations where it's required for Deacon to do the uh, tush push, the quarterback sneak, uh, rollouts more often. We saw that even a little bit on uh, on Saturday night against Michigan State. Not saying he's better, not saying Iowa's ceiling is higher, but if you had told me that, you know, at the beginning of September that Iowa would start the month of October without Luke Lachey and Cade McNamara, uh, I think we would be looking at like two and two or something like that. And Iowa could win this weekend, be five and one halfway through the season. And Iowa fans are still going to be really pissed off. I think you actually raised a very important point. I, I got to say, I, I was stunned. This is a little foreshadowing to the picks segment tomorrow. I, I, I was stunned that Iowa was only a two point favorite home against Purdue. 
And I, I think, and I, you know, I know he, you know, that was not an easy breakup and he didn't live, live, live on the best of terms. I, I don't care about that. All, all Cade McNamara is going to be for me, Aaron, is the quarterback that ended our 17 year championship drought. And I'm always going to, uh, you know, remind him of that. And I'm, I'm not going to hold a 21, 22, 23 year old who, you know, gets his ego bruised very publicly. I'm not going to hold him accountable for the rest of his life because he didn't necessarily handle that the best, okay? What he didn't handle the best is winning a Big Ten damn championship. So I'm going to remember Cade McNamara as a Michigan fan for that. That notwithstanding, he was not playing well. The offense wasn't doing well. Wasn't doing well. I don't think that's on all, all on him. I, I agree it's not all on him. I think it's systemic, but that's actually going to make my point for me. Why, if if Cade McNamara started and it was going to start in this game, I would would be close to a touchdown favorite, maybe seven. You're going to tell me Cade McNamara is worth three or four points in the line, given the way he was playing and what we saw on offense? I don't think it was. I think that's a way overreaction. Actually, I I, I think that's a way overreaction. In in some respects, and and maybe this will be viewed as faint praise. I don't I don't mean it to be. I'm not you know being a smartass here. But the reality is, given the state of the Iowa program the last few years, is there any program that's you know consistently a, a top 25 team or thereabouts that the injury to a starting quarterback is less relevant than for the Iowa football program? You no. see what I'm saying? Yeah. So why, you know, what, what benefit is it to you? You don't have any, you know, if you're Cade McNamara, you don't have any deep affinity for necessarily for Kirk Ferentz. Maybe you do, but definitely not for the Iowa program. So it's not like this is a loyalty thing. You've already transferred once. I I just, I feel, I should say this as well. I feel for him. I really do believe that he thought he was going to come in here and turn things around by hook or by crook. And the first half of the first game, it looked like that was going to be the case. Yeah, the first 39-yard touchdown pass to a wide receiver of all creatures. Didn't know that was allowed. It looked like that was going to be the case. I really appreciate his confidence and his leadership in that. But this is bigger than him, and I think we're all seeing that now. And so I really do feel for for the guy because he missed all of last season, which he was probably, you know, with McCarthy's ascendance, he, he probably wasn't going to, to play anyway. But then you get in this year, and it looks like you're stuck in neutral at best, and then you've got more injuries. I just, It's just a really sucky card for the guy. One last thing on this before we move on, and I, I wish I remember which show I was listening to. I would give them credit if I, if I did. But I was listening to a national show on a podcast here. Oh, it was the Cover 3 podcast. Oh, yeah. Which is outstanding, by the way. Um, they were pointing out, talking about Iowa, how Mark Rick's era at his alma mater, Miami, ended. And if you remember when Mark Rick got ran at Georgia for only going 9-3 and three every year, mm-hmm. and he takes over at his alma mater, Miami, and they, you know, they started 10-0 and his first year. We get to, I think it was year three or so, and he's on the outs, and his son is the offensive coordinator. And they, the boosters in the program basically come to him and say, you can stay, but the son's got to go. We need to upgrade there. And Mark Richt is like, you know, man, I've made millions of dollars, and I'm at the latter stages of my career. I'll be damned if the last thing I do is fire my, son. Fire my <laughs> own son, okay? I'm not doing that. And so he had to go too, and they drew that analogy with Kirk Ferentz, that at this stage of his career, given everything he's done for that university, is Kirk Ferentz really going to say, yeah, you bet it, age 70 or whatever, I'm going to, after, you know, I've given you 25 years, but I'm going to fire my son for you. And I thought that was a fascinating analogy. What's your read on that as an Iowa fan? That is a fascinating analogy. I think Kirk Ferentz, I think he's the type of guy who has a lot of pride in himself and the program that he's built. As he should. As he should. If I were, if if I were, you know, the czar of Iowa football, I would just say, Kirk, you're going to go the the paterno route on the football field. Of course, you're going to go the paterno route. You are our figurehead here. You still get the say on, you know, are we going for it on this fourth down? But at the end of Joe Paterno, of course, I was younger then. Did anybody really believe that Joe Paterno was like deeply involved in the X's right. and O's of right. defensive and, and offensive? Or Bobby Bowden's another great example Bowden. of this. Yeah. You're our figurehead here. You are Iowa football. But we're going to need you to either demote Brian to what he's really good at, which is the offensive line, and the offensive side of the ball is going to be completely given over to the best 
offensive coordinator from the group of five. That's what I would love to see. Bring it, make, think, make him co-offensive coordinator, running game coordinator. Yes. Offensive line coach. Yes. Bring somebody in to be the co-offensive coordinator, passing game coordinator, which really means they're the offensive coordinator. Yeah. But you save some, you know, face there and you don't humiliate a guy who's uh, who's who is responsible for building a brand new stadium, yep. you know, winning uh, division championships, and yep. and sticking around when he had ample opportunities, including at my school, Michigan. Not to mention the NFL had ample opportunities to go other places. So yeah. So we'll see if the interim AD at Iowa, Beth Getz, we'll see if that's in the cards for her. That's got to be a really t- and I've really I really liked what I've seen from her so far. Um, especially with NIL. I mean, she's actually talking to the guys over there now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's got to be a really, really tough situation to be in interim-wise, and she's probably going to take on the full-time role. But we'll see what she does. Um, he's also, as you said, he's 70 years old, so I don't know how much longer he wants to keep doing this anyway. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about Maryland 5-0, and off to their best start. Uh, the Terps are since 2001. We told you last week that this is their best start in terms of when they were 4-0 and margin of victory since 1913. For those of you wondering, that's before World War I, okay? Um, it's the first time they've ever started 2-0 in the Big Ten since they joined the league. And now, Aaron, they get a big spotlight, the big noon Sunday kickoff against the Ohio State Buckeyes this weekend. They're about a 20-point underdog, but Talia Tagovailoa coming off one of the best games in Maryland school history. And... When you consider this is a school that's produced a fair share amount of NFL quarterbacks like Frank Reich, Boomer Esiason, that is saying something. I was very impressed. No look ahead for them at all with Indiana. Um, But they have played the softest schedule in our league, according to Sagarin. It's the 132nd ranked schedule in the country, according to Sagarin. And there's only 133 FBS teams. So this is a big step up. On the other hand, we've really only seen Ohio State look like the machine we've known them as here in the... Uh, the Trestle Urban and early Ryan Day era for essentially one quarter yep. against Western Kentucky, yep. right? So how do you see this one and how big of a spot is this for the Terps who remember a year ago down into the final minute before some quirky things with a fumble and a couple of other things happened uh, a year ago, they were, it was a three point game against Ohio state in the final minute. Yeah. I think this one is uh, going to come down to the fourth quarter as well. Again, that's the big bugaboo you just said. It's a very soft schedule. But I've seen Maryland play a couple of times now. In this last game uh, against Indiana, I had that on the on the side uh, auxiliary monitor. Uh, they just looked at, What I look for with teams a lot is if you're having success, whether it's in-game or throughout the course of a season, is it super fluky? Is it just kind of helter-skelter out there, a lot of bounces going your way? And the best thing I can say about Maryland, especially against Indiana, is that they just looked under control. They Mm -hmm. looked like they had the game in control basically the entire way. And so that's the biggest compliment that I can give them. Obviously, they're going to get tested this week, but this is not, they're not facing, It's I think it's obvious at this point, they're not facing a C.J. Stroud at quarterback now. They are going to be facing a very and boy, good... boy, is he lighting up the NFL right now. Wow. Uh, yeah, surprisingly so. I mean, just last week, uh, well, the week before as well. Uh, but they're not facing that at quarterback anymore. They are facing a pretty decent defense that's going to give them the biggest test of the, of the season so far. But, man, if there's uh, ever an opportunity, perhaps, for a statement uh, victory or a victory or a game that could really shake up what we thought was coming in the Big Ten East, it could be this weekend. And I'll, I'll get to this more in my confidence picks tomorrow. I know we're, we're thinking we've got Ohio State with these great wide receivers. We've got Maryland with a great quarterback. We're going to see a lot of points scored. Um, I, I, I think it could be a lot. I think it could be lower scoring than what a lot of people think. It's not going to be an Iowa-style defensive fl- slugfest. I wouldn't expect to see 60, 70 points. Of course, come Sunday, I could, I could be eating my words, but... Uh, It'll be a fun game, regardless. Then we go to the two-time reigning Big Ten champion, Michigan Wolverines. Any coincidence at all, Michigan has looked dominant the two games since Jimmy Harbaugh returned from his suspension. Maybe this is why the one of the reasons why those coaches make all that money, Aaron. Yeah, good grief. I was shocked. I, I hadn't, I was, like I said, I was mowing... I wasn't really, I was just getting in, getting, got out of the shower, and they were already up like 14 nothing. That was pretty surprising to me because Michigan has not 
really started that fast Hadn't this covered season. a game all year yeah. long. Had yeah. not started that fast this season. And I thought maybe the the legs of Nebraska's quarterback, uh, Harburg, is it? Yep, Heinrich Harburg. Heinrich Harburg. What a sweet name I that thought is. maybe that would give them, the defense, something else to look at. No, I think they had a plan. I think they had him handled pretty much the whole game. And, um, yeah, it was an impressive win because that was their first, that was their only road game, correct? Yep. Of the season so far, going on in uh, in uh, Lincoln in front of a huge uh, huge crowd. It was pretty impressive. The most impressive part of that game is what you know everybody was talking about from that game. How in the world did Roman Wilson make that catch in the first half? That was just unbelievable. I saw several replays of it from the actual sideline view, and it's mm-hmm. like, how, how in the world did he make that catch? Yeah, that's an all-timer. Really, yep. really impressive. And then we go to, by the way, Nebraska was just minutes away from its first shutout at home since 1968. Yikes. All right, then we go to Illinois. Last year, Illinois was number one in the nation in scoring defense, number three in the nation in total defense. And yes, the Illini lost in an all-world secondary, but they still return what a lot of people thought was at least the best defensive line in our league, not among the big three, and maybe a defensive line that could compete with that. And that, next to quarterback, is probably the most important impact position in college football. Nevertheless, Aaron... The Illini are, are, are giving up over 200 yards more a game than they did last year. No one has, I think, gotten fewer than 360 yards of offense against them. Uh, they just lost again to their former coordinator, uh, Ryan Walters, who got his first Big Ten win and uh, frankly just took over the defensive uh, signal calling and, and embarrassed his former program and former boss, Brett Bielema, who remember, we talked about at Big Ten Media Days throughout the course of August, Bielema was expressing a lot of confidence that this was t- this team was still returned a lot and was being slept on. I, I don't know where they go from here. I, I mean, I, I think that after that loss, trying to get this team to rally uh, and, and get to six wins, I think it's going to be quite the challenge for Burt, who you know I like and had a breakthrough year last year, but I, I maybe sometimes was it false bravado? Did he just not read his team? Because this is nothing close to the vibes he was giving no. us heading into the kickoff of the year. Yeah, and I think the story out of this game as well is Ryan Walters taking over the defensive play calling duties. Uh, looked like looked like a pretty big difference over there in, in Purdue and in, in West Lafayette. So that may be something to keep an eye on. But when it comes to Illinois. It turns out that losing a bunch of talent to the NFL, and when you don't have, you, you still haven't been there long enough, Brett Bielema, to have developed kind of depth. And it's hard to do that at a place like Illinois still. So we're seeing that right now. Just not a whole lot of depth. Um, probably didn't have that much last year. Just your frontline guys were so good, covered up for a lot of that. But I, I don't know where you go from here either, because this Big Ten West, as we ta- talked about last week, you know, uh, talking about Iowa, uh, what's the definite loss? Well, let, what's the definite win? I think pretty much everybody's having that conversation, yeah. except for maybe Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, so that's, I, I don't know. This is this is going to be one of those seasons where, again, uh, does Brett have the, the, the capability of motivating a team, trying to get them up game after game, where the results on the field are nowhere close to what you want them to be? Finally, let's talk about Sparty. Mel Tucker officially fired. Uh, Mel Tucker has also notified the university intends to sue. Uh, Urban Meyer came out today and said, I have no idea what these internet rumors are. There's no chance I'm going to be the Michigan State football coach. Um, Right on the way to the Iowa game this weekend, the Michigan State football players were all received an email notice that their collective was canceling their NIL deals, that they're out of money. It's just not there. I don't know, man. This thing, I'm a Michigan fan, so I don't want to embellish. But this 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 thing looks problematic, and I I know this notion out there that, and I think there's credence to it, that there are 34 jobs better than every other job in college football because they're going to be in the Big Ten and the SEC. I get that. But 
And, and I can see why if you're a Jonathan Smith at Oregon State or a Jason Dickert at Washington State, you might be thinking, I don't even know what league we're going to be in. I got to get out of here when I, while I can. But I think it says something that we're talking about coaches in a very desperate situation. Thinking about taking this job, given the state of the administration, who knows what's going to come out now if Mel, if, if Mel Tucker is truly going to sue the university. That kind of seems like a scorched earth uh, exercise. Nobody wins. You're, you're maybe, even, even with everything intact, this is maybe the ninth or tenth best job in the Big Ten, with, given who's coming See. in. I don't know. You know, I just... I am I exaggerating here as a Michigan fan? I saw a chatter online about, and it was tandem with the, the Urban Meyer rumors that, well, Michigan State has deep pockets. They could pay whoever they wanted to. Their boost, they have a bunch of boosters. Maybe that's true. Maybe they do have some really huge boosters. Maybe the Rocket Mortgage guy, for example. Yeah. It doesn't matter. When your school, from the television rights alone, could pay your coach, what, $10, $12 million a year, right. what more is $1, 2 $3 million a year really going to do? What we're really talking about is, what's your pecking order in this conference, and what is the state of your athletic department? And boy, howdy, they've had some issues, have they not, over the past decade? Just a few issues. So, I don't know, again, I don't know where they go from here as well. They will probably end up going, hey, who's the best uh, coach up and coming through the group of five ranks? But they're not going to be able to, I don't, I don't think they're going to be able to get any ginormous names. I think they're probably going to have to go the P.J. Fleck route that Minnesota went through. And we'll see how that... Which turned out pretty good. Which, which has turned out pretty good. But it's not going to be Mark D'Antonio, which was a circumstance of a lot of other things as well that, that led to Mark D'Antonio's success, in Michigan my opinion. Michigan messing around, for yeah, example. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's the main one. Uh, so I don't know where you go this season. I just think in the you know coming up next season, whether it's I, I don't know if the guy that they've got is the interim coach right now. He, he he's pretty well beloved, as I understand, a, a Michigan State standout in the past, whose mm-hmm. name is escaping me. Uh, so maybe that's how you how you go through this. But you're looking at the pecking order of of the Big Ten right now. And there are other teams. There's a lot of other uh, programs. In fact, this is a, a broader conversation as well. If you are in an Iowa shoe, in Iowa shoes or Minnesota shoes, or even Wisconsin shoes, Illinois shoes, Michigan State, I'd throw that when you're where you're in kind of in the middle class of the Big Ten slash you've had some tastes of the upper class of the Big Ten over the past ten seasons, and you're worried about being demoted to that lower class or going mm-hmm. to middle class uh, style, uh, I would have you look at one school, okay. And they have one of the largest stadiums in the entire country. And it's filled up like every single Saturday. And that's Texas Mm A&M. So I'm not saying don't have high standards. I'm not saying that life is going to get not going to get a lot harder. It is. But look at look at Texas A&M. They have almost unlimited resources. They have one of the largest stadiums. They have one of the most devoted fan bases that shows up week in and week out and Maybe they'll prove me wrong this year, but boy, the past few seasons, they have been the, in basically the middle, uh, the lower middle class of the SEC. That's kind of what a lot of these teams, my point is, that's what a lot of these teams' expectations are going to have to be going forward. I don't like it necessarily, but that's just the reality. Well, the league's going to be loaded, man. Absolutely loaded. All right, let's come back. We'll play Would You Rather when we return. All right, time now for our weekly game of Would You Rather here on Bigger 10. Aaron, this one is for you. Would you rather bet Maryland money line on the road at Ohio State or Minnesota money line at home against Michigan? They're virtually the exact same yep. spread as we speak. What do you think? Same styles offensively for the most part. From, in both games. In both these games. Yeah. Um, fast on fast versus ground and pound versus ground and pound. I- I'm going to go with Maryland. Uh, I just have less confidence in Ohio State than I do in Michigan right now. That's the only calculus. So I'm not saying that that necessarily Maryland's going to go out there and and uh, win the game for sure. But if you were asked giving me those two options, I have I, and I I have more confidence in Maryland than I do in Minnesota right now. So this one's pretty easy for me. Okay. Next one. Easy. If you were Caden McNamara's agent, if you had one. Would you rather him forfeit NIL money and go to a passing-centric Group of Five team or stay at Iowa and try to turn things around and get the credit for that? 
I, I, I would if I would want to know from him what's the number one thing you want out of another year of college football. Yeah, it, is it a chance to win a Big Ten championship? And and I don't know how much of a chance you'll have with USC, UCLA, Oregon, and Washington coming into the league next year. But and no divisions on top of that, you know. So it'll be fascinating for fan bases like Iowa when eight and four doesn't mean a division championship anymore. How people cope with that. Or do you really want to consider any kind of a pro football future? And if the answer is la- the latter, then you absolutely have to go the group of five route. You got to go to a program, uh, a group of five program that will let you air it out um, with an offensive, innovated mind, you know, um, like what you see with Jamie Chadwell at a Liberty, for example. Um, that kind of a program, I think, is, is where you need to be looking at uh, you know, a, a, a Jeff Tedford at Fresno State and you're a Nevada kid, so you're getting closer to home. Something like that, where there's a system in place that will allow you to show off your ability to move the ball with your arm down the field. Uh, and because I don't think you'll get to do both of those things at Iowa. And uh, I think if it so really comes down to what do you want the most out of one more year of college football? All right. All right, for you, would you rather be hiring the next football coach at Northwestern or Michigan State. This is not as big of a gap as you might expect. But no, it is when a, you throw in the expectations of the fan bases, no, it's not. But uh, it is still a gap. And for that reason, I would go with Michigan State. For no other reason than I think you have less of a chance of getting kicked out of the Big Ten <laughs> in, in the short <laughs> well, there's term. there's that. Okay. And I think... You know, I think Michigan State's resources that they allocate towards their athletic department probably a little bit better than Northwestern's. Uh, so I would rather be hiring at Michigan State. All that baggage notwithstanding. Final one is for you. Would you rather be on Illinois' trajectory or Purdue's? And I didn't define whether we're talking macro or just this season. I, I think you have to go with Purdue after what you just saw. They've got a narrative to sell. And you know I love Burt, man. I like Burt. But Purdue's got a narrative to sell. We have a young coach. Um, a young minority coach, and I do think that matters. Um, and I and, and I think that matters the same way that, you know, back in the day, Notre Dame got an edge at a lot of the great Catholic high school programs around the country because of that I, that similar religious identity. I do think when you're dealing with young men, you know, uh, much has been made and written and said from movies like Boys in the Hood to, uh, all, you know, authors like Thomas Sowell and others about uh, the, the lack of male role models uh, in black America. And to have a strong black male role model there, I think, is a very a- attractive recruiting resource. When I used to cover Iowa State professionally for a living, Wayne Morgan was there as a he was an OK basketball coach, but a hella recruiter for those reasons. So, you know, a lot of mothers said, hey, this is the this is the role model figure my son is missing. And well, Iowa State got a lot of big time recruits because of that. And I could see Purdue parlaying that, too. So I I think right now I'd much rather be on Ryan Walter's trajectory because it's also just starting. Right. It's yep. also just starting. So time is on your side. I mean, if, if we're having the same conversation about Illinois next year, I, I don't know that Brett Bielema survives that. Do you? Not totally sure. Yeah, not totally sure. I don't know what their expectations are in Champaign right now, but yeah, yeah I'm not sure. And that's that's not what we were saying at this time last year. No. So that kind of shows you, that illustrates the trajectory we're, yeah. we're talking about. I agree. All right, we'll come back with our Twitter poll results and feedback of the week to wrap it up next. This week's Twitter poll results, would Maryland win the Big Ten West? Aaron, 75% said yes. 25% said no. Pretty resounding result there as a fan of a Big Ten West team. I voted yes. You voted yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you could say as well, well, Wisconsin uh, is there as well, and that's, that's you know, at least a toss-up. Here's the thing. Wisconsin's trying to play the style of offense that Maryland already plays and is pretty good at. So I would give the pretty easy and definitive edge to Maryland in a matchup like that. The rest of the way around... We talked about last week, Maryland could win eight, nine games. Are there any team, any teams, including Wisconsin, were absolutely sure about that? I, right. I don't think so. So I think they'll, that they'd be a shoe in to win the West. All right, that brings us to our feedback of the week. Based AF Spectator, in response to my latest Big Ten power ratings on the Bigger Ten account, said the implications of the Illinois, Northwestern, Minnesota, Purdue, Quagmire for tiebreaker scenarios in the East are real. 
And, you know, we haven't talked about this in a couple of months. It came up when I came out with my annual football preview in July. But if you go through the tiebreakers, if we end up with, and I think, man, this is looking more and more likely, a scenario where Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State lose to nobody else but each other. So Michigan goes to Happy Valley and loses. Penn State goes to the Horseshoe and loses. Uh, Ohio State goes to Michigan and wins. Penn, so those teams have all beaten each other, and they're 11-1. and one. And you start working your way through the tiebreakers, you get to the fifth tiebreaker, Aaron, and that tiebreaker is winning percentage of uh, best win percentage of among non-divisional opponents. Yep. So when you look at this, and this is where Ohio State playing at Wisconsin here later in the month, that may end up being quietly one of the most important games in the Big Ten and because by virtue of playing Wisconsin, that would boost Ohio State's fortunes in that win percentage model, for example. Yeah, and if you're Penn State, you're hoping Iowa can do their best to run right. the table as right. well. Yeah. And uh, if you're Michigan, that you know that's the same for Minnesota. Yeah, the Northwestern beating Minnesota was a crusher for Michigan. Yeah, in yeah. the tiebreaker scenario. Yeah, yeah. I, when I first read this, I didn't realize what based AF Spectator was talking about. But yeah, <laughs> holy cow, we're going to be sitting here the second, uh, third weekend of November, trying to go through in real time all of the different scenarios and. Um, Man, you're going to need a super supercomputer to work that out. I mean, you never know. Alabama won a national championship one year because Bert, when Bielema was at Arkansas, he converted a fourth and 28 against Old Miss. And if that had not happened, Alabama would not even have made the playoff. Yeah. You just What's never know. What's that moment going to be? Yeah. Because there's going to be, if it's not, you know, let's say Ohio State kind of drops out, you're still Penn State and Michigan. And there's still some of these tiebreakers in play there. Mm -hmm. There's going to be, we're going to look back and say, uh, on some rainy night in early November, you know, uh, Minnesota or Northwestern uh, threw a Hail Mary against Iowa at Wrigley Field. And that's what kept Michigan out of the Big Ten Championship. Something like that. Yeah. So You know what I would do if I were all these leagues? I'd have head-to-head tiebreaker. And if that doesn't apply, I would say... Highest team rated in the college football rankings determines it. Yeah. The, and that's it. That's all I'd have for tiebreakers. Instead of head nine head, different layers yep, of tiebreakers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Head to head. And if, if there's no clarity there, then highest rated team in the college. If we're doing all this to engineer outcomes in the college football playoff, then have those rankings be yeah. the next tiebreaker. That's yeah. what I would do. All right, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Bigger Ten. Don't forget to like, rate, follow, subscribe, five-star review, share, help us to find, please, more Big Ten fans and sports fans just like you, so they'll come and watch us here on Bigger Ten. You can watch us in between episodes by following us on Twitter, at Bigger Ten. Always fun to do it on game day, too. At Bigger Ten on Twitter. For Aaron McIntyre, I'm Steve Days. We'll see you next week right here on Bigger Ten.